Mangin. It is February 25th, 2020. We're here at Duke Spine Institute, Surgery Center of Vieira, getting ready to, to perform a uh, spinal surgery procedure called anterior cervical discectomy and fusion. We don't do a lot of these anymore because most of our patients select to have the Duke laser disc repair done. But once in a while we get a patient who um, their insurance won't cover the surgery, the Duke laser disc repair, or they want the ACDF or need an ACDF, but it's very rare. But we have a special treat for you because we're gonna be doing an anterior cervical discectomy for decompression with fusion. This is a challenging case because this patient has a disc herniation at C7-T1 as well as C5-6 and C6-7. And C7-T1 herniation is very hard to get to. So we're gonna try to get there. I've already told the patient we may not be able to get to C7-T1 during the surgery. What happens is the collarbone here blocks our access. But I think we may be able to get to it, so we're giving it a, gonna give it a good try. Our blood pressure is nice and low, right? You can actually bring it up a little if you want. Perfect. All right. We've already done our timeout, so we're gonna go ahead and make an incision. What's that? All right, incision. We're using a number 10 scalpel. Because this is a three level, I'm gonna be doing a oblique incision rather than a transverse incision. So we already said five, six, six, seven, seven, one, correct? Two, three, four, five, six, six, seven, seven, one. Everybody's in agreement? I'm sorry? <coughs> Thank you, Luis. All right, so we've gone through the uh, skin. Now we're gonna go through uh, the soft tissues. We have fat here. All right, so I'm gonna be teaching Jason, who's a physician assistant, who's learning. He's not done one of these before, so I'll be working and teaching him as we go along. When we encounter veins, we wanna bipolar them generally. But for right now, Jason, you're just gonna be lifting up. All right. Now we're gonna be looking for the sternocleidomastoid muscle. The sternocleidomastoid muscle runs right along from the back of the ear down to the, to the uh, sternum. I wanna get through this muscle. This is the platysma right now. That's the first muscle we encounter, scissor. You're doing good, Jason, just keep lifting. So once I get below the platysma, I wanna create a plane. So I'm gonna go in with my scissors and spread. And what I'm developing is a plane, a surgical plane above the sternocleidomastoid muscle, but below the platysma muscle. The platysma muscle is, is a very thin muscle. And it is uh, located just below the subcutaneous tissues in the neck. In some people it's more developed, in other people it's less developed. Below the platysma muscle, uh, bipolar, I need a bipolar pedal, is it here? Should be at my left foot. I don't feel it in my left foot. Beth, can you check, please? The bipolar pedal should be right here. Let's not go too much higher than where you are on the blood pressure. Huh? My headlight is plugged in. You're talking about the camera. Why is the bipolar not working? Oh, there it is. Good. It's working. I don't hear a, a noise. I like a buzzing noise. Maybe, I think you just have to turn the volume up. 
what I'm bipolaring here or coagulating, folks, is veins. Scissor. And if you, it looks like our blood pressure has gone up considerably. We're starting to ooze. All right. So I have gone through the um, platysma muscle, and we're going to close that later. And now I need to basically go medial to the sternocleidomastoid muscle. So there's the sternocleidomastoid muscle right here. There are the strap muscles there, and there's a plane between the sternocleidomastoid and the strap. And that's the plane that I'm looking for. Bipolar. Is there vo no volume on the bo bipolar? Guys, yells. There we go. No, that's just the music. Bipolar. So, Jason, you're doing good. You want to lift straight up? And a little bit towards you, yes, slightly. So I can see here there's a big vein. I think you all can see it, right? Are you guys getting the feed or no? Guys, are you getting the feed or no? Sean? We're not getting the feed from the head cam. We're trying to figure out the connection issue. Uh, fine. So who's coordinating the effort of getting the first person feed to the audience? Sonny is checking on the connection right now. Fine. This is just a little vein that's running along the margin uh, between the sternocleidomastoid muscle and the strap muscle. Not an important vein. May need to be sacrificed. Uh, let's see. Bipolar or Bovi actually? Sorry. Lift up. Okay, uh, can we get a green light? Can you look right on the box? If it's a green light. If it's a green light, it'll be fine. Good job, Luis. I like how you're okay, taking so control. Apparently, we have a green light on the um, video transformer here. We now see the head cam view. Huh? The head cam view is up and running. I can't hear you. What did you say, Sean? We have the feed from the head cam. All right. How is it? It looks good. The scissor should be in the middle of the field. Yep. Okay. Nice and clear. Yeah. Is the table all the way down? Needs to be. Actually, this is a different table, so let's try to drop it. The way I do ACDF surgery, folks, I'm just going to say uh, it's, it's a very good Put technique because, no, that's perfect. Because um, for a lot of surgeons, I need my uh, lipless. A lot of surgeons, the exposure takes a long time. And the reason is they don't do it properly. So this is called a lipless retractor. I need a kitty. You're going to stay here helping me. Nope, I'm going to hold this initially. You are going to take it, but when I go to a lift yes, is when you're going to take it. All right, we got the omohyoid muscle here. So I have to sweep it north because um, the omohyoid comes across our surgical field basically, and it goes from medial to lateral. It gets in the way. We're going to probably have to sacrifice it. I'm looking right now at the carotid artery. It's right here, this white thing. You see that? And we're sweeping the strap muscles medial, okay? There's a little branch of the anza cervicalis right there, that nerve. And that basically means handle of the bucket. 
I'm really basically down on top of the spine right now. That's the spine down there. You all see that? That's the spine right there that I'm sweeping, okay? Now that I've developed the plane, I'm in the retropharyngeal space. I'm gonna take my lip retractor. I've got good relaxation of the pharyngeal muscles. So thank you, take this, hold it. Now, I gotta teach Jason a little bit because he hasn't assisted on one of these. All right, towing in means you come in like this and you bring your toe in. When you tow in, your knee comes in and blocks my view, all right? You don't wanna do that. So when you tow in and retract, you wanna retract your toe and your knee at the same time. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. All right, so go ahead and hold it. I'm gonna look down here. You gotta suck while you're helping me. Perfect, bipolar. So this is a little bit of a membrane um, behind the uh, esophagus and pharynx. It's a retropharyngeal space. It always has little veins in it and you can't even see those veins until you start messing with the membrane, like touching it and manipulating it. Then all the veins pop out. I mean, it gets crazy. So at this point, I need to know where am I? I don't know which disc I'm looking at. And the only way to know for sure is to actually to get an x-ray picture. So that looks like a disc to me. So I'm gonna go ahead and put a localizer, which is a basically an 18 gauge needle that snapped off. So it's nice and short. I'm gonna put that in there to see where I'm at, okay? That's gonna help me figure out what where I'm at. A lot of bone spur here. Yeah, this patient has calcification of his ligament. Let's just see where that is. Come on out, take this. Let me show you how to come out, nope. How you come out is you go this way and then up. I need floral in. Hold this. Do not let it move. I need the table up a little bit. So we're gonna use an x-ray picture looking at the bones in the neck to figure out, it, don't touch that, to figure out where we are. Start rotating it, please. Yep, yep, nice job, keep going. I don't want you touching that area, okay? Just leave it alone. Drop the fluoro. Raise the table a little bit. That's good. All right, let's get a let's get a shot. You may be too high, too north. I need to see the fluoro shot. All right. Okay, I'm not seeing anything here. All right, that's better. All right, um, you need to clean that up. Tell me when you're ready. Yeah. Oh, nice. All right. So two, three, four, five, six, seven. Looks like we're at six, seven. Looks like we're just below six, seven. So two, three, four, five, six, seven. So I need this disc plus the one above plus the one below, right? Table down, four oh out for now. Actually, see if you can go north. Or are you really going to hit the legs? Uh, How far are you from the space. legs? No, How far are you from the legs? I need somebody to grab this. Do not, no, 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 do not touch the scope. Just grab that edge right there and pull it. Yeah, further. Pull it further. Keep going. Good. All right. Uh, is that as far north as you can go? So you're hitting the legs. Yeah, right? The post. Yeah. So yeah, we cannot use this bed in the future. All right. So let me just take a look while we're here. Yeah. Hold this. Okay. Hold that. Yeah. Let me have a lipless. So... What we're doing right now is figuring out where we are relative to the discs, okay? And 
uh, its discs that I operate on. This patient's disc is what needs to be repaired. Bovi, okay, I'm going to use a Bovi. All right, you just stay where you are. Move south just a little bit. There you go, perfect. All right, let me have the Penfield um, 4. No, that's a Penfield. That's what I asked for. All right, that should be the, the disc. Come on out. Come on, man. Use your brain. There you go. Right? You remember what I showed you? North and then tilt and come out. Okay? Let's get another fluoro. So for those of you who just joined us, we're doing a anterior cervical discectomy infusion, ACDF. This surgery has been done for 100 years plus. Table is too far, no too high. Drop it. Let's go. Good. Hold on. Let me pull the shoulder. Shot. All right. I cannot really tell. Uh, two, three, four, five. It almost looks like six, seven, but I cannot tell for sure. I need better penetration at the bottom. Do we have a shoulder pull or not? Shot. Yeah, it's still not entirely clear. So two, three, four, five, six, seven. All right, we're just going to have to re-image it again once I get started. So go ahead and drop the table, move the floral north. Let me see if I can get more exposure up top. This patient has herniated discs. D drop the table, take this, hold it there. Let me have mine. I like the muscle relaxation we're getting right now. It's really, really good. Okay, Bovi. We know for sure, toe in. Retract, yeah. Why is that? Unreal. North. Move north. Not your, don't tilt north, you have to slide north. Move north. Yep, good. Keep sliding north. All right, that's probably five, six. Can you guys see okay? Sean? Yes, we can. All right, let me have the pen field again. Yes, sir. I need a floral shot again. Hold on. Not yet. Big bone spur here. This should be 5-6. Come out. Good job. Table, table up, floral south. Hold this here. Let me give a shoulder pull when you're ready. John. All right, so two, three, four, five, six. Two, three, four, five, six. That's five, six. Table down, floral out. Take it out completely. Yep, take it out. Drop the table, please. Drop it. Drop it, drop it. Get the floral out. Let's go, pronto. All right. Let me have your lip. Let me have your lip retractor. I have to place your retractor first, okay? Hold it here. Let me have mine. So I know toe in, please. Can you see? Yeah, well you need to see. Okay, so see this thing? It's in the middle of the spine. You see how much you can see on my side? Yes, you need to show me that much. There you go. Okay. Good. Yes, All right. Take that. Ca um, kitty. Yes, so I know that's five, six. I need that exposed, that bone. It's a big bone spur, by the way. This thing is humongous. All right. 
and then we need to go further south. All right. So let me see a bovi. Yes, so I use a bovi to expose it in a subperiosteal fashion. What I'm exposing is the bone. You have to have the bones exposed properly. So I'm just painting the soft tissue. You should be following me. Wherever I go, you go. Slide south. Five, six. That's six, seven. And then we need seven, one down here. Suck, suck. Good job, by the way. I'm not going to expose that yet. I'm going to come north. All right, I need to get this, get back in here, okay? Scissor. Actually, let me see. Um, yeah, scissors good. No, no, relax. You're, you're perfect. So one of the important things about surgery assisting is something called counter traction, okay? And I cannot do my surgery without appropriate counter traction. What counter traction means is that you're pulling on your side as I'm pulling on mine. No bipolar. And what that does is it allows me to, to separate the planes of tissue and see where everything is. So this is the alternative. This is the standard, what every, which most doctors will do for a herniated disc in the neck, is they're going to do an ACDF. Another standard is the um, artificial disc scissor. Once I use the bo bipolar, I need a scissor. And another standard would be the Duke laser disc repair. So there's really three, let me just bipolar it a little more, three standard surgeries for treating herniated discs in the neck surgically. One is uh, endoscopic. Duke laser disc repair. Another is anterior cervical decompression and fusion. Another is anterior cervical arthroplasty, which is a metal disc going in your neck. Of all of those surgeries, I've done them all. I've done a thousand of these surgeries that you're watching right now in my career. Over a thousand. And I've done over a thousand of the laser surgeries. Of all these surgeries, the laser is the best. However, this patient could not have the laser surgery for a couple of reasons. Number one, this bottom disc I have to attack and fix is too far, it's too too deep and too, the angle of, of attack isn't right for a, the Duke laser disc repair. Plus he's got these bone spurs here. They're like shields blocking his disc. There's no way to get my needle in there to do the laser surgery. So this is a perfect example of a patient who would not be appropriate for laser surgery. And that may be why we're doing the open surgery in his case. It's more of an anatomical reason rather than an insurance reason. All right, so I need to be able to get down one more disc to fix down there. And that's what I'm expecting to be able to do. Kitty? I wasn't sure I'd be able to get to it. These need a little bit more, okay? And by the way, yes, sir. They're supposed to be. Like that. Okay, perfect. Come on, Luis, you're killing me. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Yeah. Let's go north. All right, so we know that's five six. Come on, come on, follow me south. I told you, follow me six seven. That's got to be seven one there. So. We're close enough to go for it. Let's say 71. Bipolar. That's a bipolar hand. I have a little bit of soft tissue here that I have to take care of with a bipolar. But what we're looking at, folks, is the spine. This is the spine right here. Scissor. And what we're retracting, just so you all are aware, is we're retracting on my side the carotid artery. That's right here. And on his side, Jason's side, we've got the esophagus and trachea. All right, Bovi. So now that I've, I've seen the top and bottom of my exposure, I'm going to start Luis. Yes, sir. Okay. This has to line up with this arrow here, okay? You put the arrow in like that, and that is the proper way, not the arrow over here. It turns the blade a certain way that has to be done exactly right. All right. Suck. Yep. 
good. Just stay right next to where I'm working. You need to be moving south with me when I move south. Okay, you're doing a good job, but you need to pay attention to the details. Surgery is all about the details. You can do shitty surgery and not pay attention to the details. But if you want to do good surgery, you better be paying attention to all the little details. Yes, sir. I don't do shitty surgery, by the way, just in case you're wondering. Yes, sir. I don't let anyone turn my surgery into shit either. Down here. All right. For those of you who have not watched uh, Duke Spine Institute or Duke Spine Foundation broadcast, all of our surgeries are broadcasted live. We don't edit anything, and it's sort of like reality TV for spine surgery. All right, now it's a little tricky down here. Instead of lifting up, you're actually pushing down. It actually makes it a lot easier, okay? Yes, Just don't push down too much because the heart is down there. Hold this here. What a nice exposure right there, huh? You see that? Look at that view. Isn't that beautiful? Yes, All right, we're at the C7 T1 disc right here, which is really nice. And then the T1 vertebral body will be right here. So I didn't, I didn't necessarily expect to be able to get here, but I'm really happy that we're able to do this. I was worried because in most patients you can't do the uh, C7 T1 disc. But in this patient, I think we're going to be able to do it. It's a little too early to say for sure, but let's follow me up. Follow me up. Follow me up. All right. Nice and gentle. When you're sliding along the tissues, you don't want to force it. You want to just slide, okay, in the natural plane. Starting to fight the uh, pharyngeal muscles a little more. Anything you can do about that would be greatly appreciated. Just a little bit more. I think I feel like it's wearing off a little bit. Hold this here. Hold it here. All right, Luis, I'm going to need your help. Yeah. This is, by the way, the the um, longest coli muscle. You're going to hold this retractor. I know that C5, that C6, and that C7, and that's C7, T1, and that's T1. Yeah, I can tell his blood pressure has gone up because he's starting to bleed. I don't know what you're saying. Just, yeah. Don't go anywhere near the neck. We have a question from our audience. Sure. One of our viewers asks, if I get Duke laser disc repair surgery, say for example on a Monday, would it be safe to have a knee replacement the following week, or how long do you have to heal before you have another surgery? Great question. Um, so I'm considering having Duke laser disc repair done one week, and then the following week a knee replacement. Is it safe? The answer is yes, it is safe to have your other surgery a week later. If you're having a Duke laser disc repair done on your neck, then you're going to want to, uh, you're going to want, Luis, can you step back for a second, please? Let me stand here. If you're having Duke laser disc repair done on your neck, on your cervical spine, you're going to want to wear a collar for that second surgery. And you're going to want the anesthesiologist to innovate you fiber optic. So they're going to want to not manipulate your neck very much. They're going to want to keep you in a collar. But good anesthesiologists can do that, no problem. Um, yeah, so I would say a week later would be okay for a, a joint replacement surgery. I don't see a problem with that. Right now we're just playing with the patient's blood pressure cuff because the blood pressure cuff they put on the arm right where I'm standing and they're getting uh, not good readings. So. Where do you think we are with the blood pressure? All right. Yeah, you never really want to put it on the side the surgeon stands.
other questions right now? None so far. All right. So for those of you watching, we are performing an anterior cervical decompression or discectomy infusion. There are about 200,000 of these surgeries done in the United States every year. They're done to treat basically herniated disc disease, spinal stenosis. In some patients, in some patients bone spurs. 95% of those ACDF surgeries could be done as an endoscopic disc repair, Duke laser disc repair, rather than as an ACDF. So in my opinion, from based on my extensive experience doing spine surgery over 22 years, 95% of the ACDFs done in the United States are basically unnecessary and they could be treated, the patients could be treated for their herniations with endoscopic Duke laser disc repair surgery instead. The problem is, is that the surgeons doing ACDFs, and there are probably about 6,000 of them in the United States, the surgeons doing ACDFs don't, um, don't know how to do the Duke laser disc repair. So the Duke laser disc repair is a new advanced technology that has to basically be taught to other surgeons for them to know how to do it. And this applies worldwide as well. All right, are we ready? What, what do you need us to do? I mean, he seems to be perfusing well, so I know he's not hypo. Hyper. Yeah. I'm having trouble with uh, my cables. I'll come to you. They're pulling. Yeah. You can't touch the scope, okay? But. For some reason, it's pulling. <sighs> yeah, that's good. Mm -hmm. The reason why people have to do a fusion after a discectomy in the neck is that if you take the entire disc out between the bones, the bones are going to collapse on top of each other. So the disc is about a centimeter of space, and when the bones suddenly collapse on top of each other, it will cause horrible pain, and it'll cause neurological compromise. So in the old days, they used to just do discectomy where they took the disc out, and then the patients developed a post-operative deformity of their spine where the, they would get kyphosis, and the spine would collapse at the disc and kink forward, and patients were in horrible debilitating pain and their nerves would get crushed and their spinal cord would get crushed and they would become paralyzed. And we realized, oh my God, we can't just take the disc out, we need to actually put something in there. And so the earlier surgeons um, were putting in something called cadaver bone or fibular, struct or fibular graft, which is basically a piece of the fibula bone in your leg from a dead person, cadaver. And the problem with those grafts are they would reabsorb over time after surgery. They would collapse as well because they would just dissolve. And so then somebody realized, well, why don't we try using a, a metal cage instead that won't dissolve? And the metal cages, the problem with them is they're too stiff. And so they would cause a reaction in the end plate of the bone and you would get all kinds of inflammation and pain and failure to fuse. So then they went on with developing other stuff. We even used to put pieces of coral skeleton as a inner body spacer. And uh, those coral skeletons were used at one point. Now we use something called PEAK, polyether ether ketone. It's basically a carbon polymer. And it's got the perfect amount of compliance so that it's not too stiff like metal where it can fracture the end plates of the bone. And it's just, it's got a nice, what's called a modulus of elasticity. So the bulk modulus of elasticity determines the softness of, of the material. And the peak cages are perfect for being soft enough that they won't fracture the end plate, 
or collapse and disintegrate, but they're also firm enough that they allow fusion and, and stabi stabilization of the joint. So most surgeons that do anterior cervical discectomy have to do a fusion. And obviously we've seen a growth over the last 20 years of, of um, artificial discs being put in instead. And the artificial discs, the problem with them is that they, in my opinion, they don't work very well because they cause pain to develop and they also can come out. Um, and that's been one of the biggest criticisms of them is that they're failure to uh, stay in place and they move. And when they move, they throw the biomechanics of the spine off. So there are problems with artificial discs. There are problems with fusion. So I was trained by overseas, primarily by Korean neurosurgeons that were advancing the field of endoscopic spine surgery to do an endoscopic surgery on the neck. Now, the most well-known Korean surgeon that did that is Dr. Joe in Pittsburgh. The problem though is that Dr. Joe would not do the surgery the way I do it. He would go through the bone and his results were nowhere near the results that I've been able to achieve with my technique of going through the disc. How are we doing? So we're on hold right now because we're waiting to to get a good pressure uh, cuff reading. What's the problem, guys, with the cuff? Are we not connected properly or what? Is the hose not connected properly? Huh? All right. back to working and we're all happy so please be careful with that hold this here go in more you're gonna need to show me, there you go, more of the spine. Bobby, move north. All right, right here, toe in. All right, Luis, I need you to hold this for me here. Okay. Give me the Penfield one. Yes, Let's try to get the blood pressure down a little bit. Can I go on deeper? No, you can't because you're blocking my right, access, so. okay, Luis? You need to do it the right yeah. way, which is your left hand. Okay, right here, suck please. Suck, please. Get rid of the blood. South. Duke Spine Institute was the first in the country to perform multi-level ACDFs outpatient, let go, in an independent surgery center. We we're also the first to broadcast those surgeries live for people to watch. Such as we're doing now. Come on, Louise, stay on the bone and hold it in. Suck here. Louise, you need to keep it here and don't move, okay? 
Are you resting your hand? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's go south. Take a look. Let go. Okay. Right here. Right here. Hold it there. Bovie. Bipolar. Take this, Louise. Hold it. Penfield. Go to your side a little bit. There you go. Come on, Louise. Put in my hand properly. Move your head. Find a place to put your head that's not blocking me. All right, move north. Move north, let's go, come across from me. Hold this. Suck, please. Suck here, we need the blood pressure down a little bit. Where are you at? Suck, dude, come on, man. Get in here and figure it out. That's good, actually, bipolar. Come on, move your arm, I'm taking it. Move your arm, get out of there. You're not showing me what I need to see. There you go. Okay. Move north. Move north. Don't retract so hard. You only retract what you need to. Go. Let go. Right here. see here all right. all right large bite come down with me again right here The more you retract his esophagus, the harder he's going to have a time swallowing after surgery. If you do it enough, he'll be admitted for dehydration. Okay? So you don't want to rough house the esophagus. You want to track firmly, but not aggressively. Okay? Just like that. Okay? That is a big ass bone spur. Let's see the floral picture. Turn that floral monitor so I can see it. And I see that's going right up to almost the top of two, three, four, five. I do want to shave it down. <coughs> Bovie, toe in. pretty impressive you guys see this thing Sean yes we can I gotta say that's a prize winning bone spur that is not normal to see that folks now, we don't do surgery just to do bone spur surgery like this but when we see a bone spur like that, you want a or that yes, that's a kerosene hand, Luis. We got to take it out. Protect. No, you got to show me the top. I can't bite his esophagus, okay? You got to make sure it's protected. Get up there north. Protect it. There you go. See? See what? You no, I can't see. You got to toe in more. Let's go. Go in more north, up here. Oh, wow. 
You all see that? Pretty impressive, huh? Stay north. Come on, Louise, wipe that. Go in. I can't see. I can't see. No, you're torquing. Pull it towards you. I just pulled it another two centimeters. Why are you not able to do that? I don't care. Then get your head to where you can see. Don't give me an excuse. Okay? And bring you to help me and give me excuses why you can't help me. What we're doing is not rocket science. Let go. Hold this here. Large bite. Go south. Keep going. I want to look and see what we got. Down here, all the way. Let's see. Kay. How's our blood pressure? Good. What's good? Yeah, it's good. All right. The more we perfuse, the harder it is to do the surgery. So it's always a balance between perfusion and being able to do the surgery. Hold this. So you want to perfuse. Don't twist it. Just hold it. What do you think I need? Yep. Very good. Not this side. I never use this side. It's this side. Stop gotcha. handing it to me the wrong way. Gotcha. Suck. Uh-huh. Good. All right. Let's move north. Let's see here. Gently, gently, gently. Come on. Come off the esophagus. You need to be sort of underneath the longest coli muscle. Move here. Let me see here. Yeah, keep moving north. Keep moving north. Suck, please. Suck, suck, suck. Come on. I don't want to see blood here. That means let go. Oh, boy. Suck, please. Yeah, we're fighting the pharynx a little more. Suck, suck, suck. Do you see my head? Where am I looking? Nope. I'm looking higher, and there's blood there. So you need to figure out where I'm looking, and you need to be clearing that area from blood. Okay? That understood? Hold this here. Hold it here. Don't let it move. Let me see. I can't see anything, okay? Your job is to clear the blood. If you don't clear the blood, I can't see what I'm doing. Suck all this blood. Get your head in there and figure it out. Hold this, Louise. Hold this here. Suck the blood. You need to change something so that you can help me here. And your hand doesn't get in the way. Take this. Let me see this. So I'm just fine tuning, folks, to place this retractor. These bone spurs have to go because what they're going to do is they're going to push our metal plate away from the spine. Right here. 
Let's see, that should be should be pretty good right there. Okay, let's move south. Yeah, keep going all the way to the bottom. All right, I'm gonna need retractor blades. Actually, huh? I need you to hold this muscle back, okay? No, Luis, I don't want to do that first. I want to put the uh, retractor blades in. Probably, no, 50-55. Okay. Yeah. And you always hand me the longer one first. You having fun there? You're just stirring up bleeding. Let's go. Good. I need to get my hand in here, so you're going to... No, you need to stay in there, but move your hand. All right, stop. Good, come on out. Hold this here and push down. Hold it down against the spine, don't move. Don't torque, don't turn it. Keep your hand this way. I don't care if it hurts your hand. Take that. Surgery is about s learning how to suffer for your patient. All right. That's what we do here. It's not enjoyable. The end result is enjoyable. Helping people get better is enjoyable, but surgery is painful. You think radiation is enjoyable? No. So you have to learn to adapt and accept. Come on. There you go. Good. All right. Well, that's looking pretty good. We've got the hardest disc. Suck in there, please. The hardest is to get to. Good. No, 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 no. So right now I want a um, popsicle stick. You have a tongue depressor, sterile? A sterile tongue depressor? All right, now we're going to put our posts in. Go find one, please. We have them. Tongue depressors are sterile when they come in. All right, I need you to retract that. So give me a lipless. Okay. Why is that soft tissue keep billowing? Huh? Hold this. Why does it keep billowing? Do you know? Um, no nope. Anybody know? That's the lungs. Ventilation. Yeah. We're right down there. Right by the lungs. move all right I need a mallet give me a little right. wacky wacky you Luis perfect let me see Again, what I'm putting in, folks, more is a distract harder. Good distraction post. So this is pretty standard for ACDF surgery. You put a metal post in the vertebral body, and then we take a distractor. That's this device. Slide it down on top of the posts. Stay where you are. And then um, I'm going to spread the disc open. All right, leave it alone. Let go. Okay. I'm going to spread that disc open. There it is. All right. Beautiful. Yeah, we're done there. What, do you need, sir? what I need is a 15 blade 
on a long handle, which you already have, I think. Ready? All right, folks, can you all see down there? So I have one post into C7 and another post into T1. Yeah, thank you very much, but I'm good now. I may need it in a little bit. Next time, have it ready in the room. I'm basically cutting the disc out. I'm doing what's called an annulec annulectomy, taking out the anterior annulus. Okay, take that. Pituitary. All right, this is going to be di disc specimen. So we're taking the T7, T1 disc out first. Now I need a five curette. I want to open this disc space up as much as possible without fracturing the bone. <sighs> now I'm going to take this disc out using a curette. Suck, please. Good. We're doing good. Just keep playing with the sucker and getting a feel for it. Cure pituitary. Okay. That's a disc material. Right. Take. All right. Now, I'm going to scrape all this disc material out. You see how hard it is to see down there? It's really hard. So what you need to do right now at this point in the surgery to do it right is you need something called a microscope. The problem is 90% of surgeons probably that do this stuff, ACDFs, they don't use a microscope because their hospital doesn't buy one. They're very expensive. Kerosin 4. Good job. I like that initiative. Just don't grab the esophagus, all right? You can only grab what you can see. Let's go. All right, there's a big bone spur right here. So I'm going to go in and bite it out. This is on the inferior end plate of C7. And this is a very important step that a lot of surgeons don't do. So people wonder about my surgery. Why do you do surgery the way you do it? I do it this way because I've done a thousand of them and paid very close attention to doing it perfect for patients so they have the best results. Why is this step necessary? If you don't take these bone spurs off the end plate, you're not gonna get the optimal size cage in. You're gonna get too small of a cage. If you get too small of a cage, the space collapses after surgery and the patient develops a kyphotic deformity which is going to create horrible pain and headaches after surgery. Neck pain and headaches. Kyphosis, bad. Most, many surgeons create kyphosis doing the surgery, even experienced ones. They're doing it for 20 years. Very common problem. All right, we need the scope in. So now we're going to bring a treat for you. We're going to bring the microscope in. All right, I'm going to put a little antibiotic irrigation while we're waiting. I'm going to get my headlight off and we're going to go under the microscope. You're all going to get to see a whole lot better. Just so you know, you've been watching my view so far.
gonna get the microphone. To get your microphone. Reach out again. It don't take an hour to do it, for God's sake. Yeah. You, you tell me to quit touching. Yeah, no. Quit touching is I got a gown, but you got to get that thing out. Hold this.
You're not on the outside, correct? You're not on the outside, correct? What? But were you outside? Were you touching over here? Okay. But you're not even in my lead, and you're not even in the lead pocket. You're. I don't know. Take a look. That's fine. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right. So at this point, we are uh, ready to continue the discectomy. And you should all be able to see the quality of the picture. This is not characteristic. You should be in there sucking. This is not characteristic of most spine surgeries of this type. OK? About half of the spine surgeons are done at this point. They don't even do the decompression properly. But I'm gonna show you the right way to do it. Everything I do from now forward is extra than what other spine surgeons do, but it's the proper way to do this, which is why my results are better at Duke Spine than any other surgeon in the world for fusions. Take that, get in there and suck, you're at five. Okay, now you're going to have to learn not to block me, and you're supposed to be coming in on your side. And you should have a pituitary in your other hand grabbing all this stuff out. This is residual disc material. This is the bottom. You cannot block my view, okay? This is the bottom of the disc, the back of the disc, and mo pretty much every orthopedic surgeon in the world will not go back here. They're afraid of the spinal cord. They're afraid of damaging the nerves, which are back here. But that's the whole purpose of the surgery is to unpinch the nerves. And so that's the decompression part. You can't do an ACDF without decompressing. You can do an ACF without decompressing, which is an anterior four. cervical fusion. Person four. four, yeah. You gotta get your big knuckle out of the way. You're blocking the view, okay? You understand? So do it without getting your knuckle in the way. Can you do that? Can Try it. Now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. See? I know you're, you're doing this. You're still in your learning phase. Move. You're not going to be able to suck these things out. Okay. If they could suck out, we would just suck it out. We wouldn't have all these tools. But the disc is stubborn. It doesn't like to come out. So you actually have to fight it. You have to go to war with it. That's what we do. That's why we have all these specialized tools. All right, now you see back there, curette three. At this point, I've gotten 95% of the disc out. And like I said, orthopedic surgeons stop now. But the problem is the herniation is still down there and they haven't gotten it out. So this is part of the herniation right here. And I'm gonna show you a little more. But with most herniations, good job, that's it. Nice. Just when I'm about to give up hope on you, Jason, you come through. Like a knight in shining armor. I love it. Clock is right twice a day, sir. Huh? All right, Kerrison 4. Have it ready. By the way, if you think I'm an impatient surgeon, if you're watching this broadcast and you're saying, boy, Dr. Duke's pretty impatient. I'm actually one of the more patient neurosurgeons out there. Believe it or not, you just don't see what happens in the operating room. I'm showing you everything happening in the operating room, but I can tell you right now, most neurosurgeons are even less patient than me. And the reason why we're impatient is for patient safety. The longer we screw around here with our team doing things wrong or ourselves doing things wrong, if that's the case, the longer the patient's under anesthesia, the higher the risk of complications. So surgeons are like, we're, we're like running a, a race, every surgery, 
trying to finish the surgery quickly, but not jeopardize the quality of the surgery to make sure everything is done properly. Kerosene four, but not wasting any time. Okay. Now, did anyone see? How's the blood pressure good? Anyone see the herniated disc while I was back there? You have to hit rewind. All right. Well, it's right there, right there, right there. Yes, you see it right there. And I've told you already, most surgeons would have stopped and they're done, but this is the herniation right here. Now it's almost impossible to see it and get it out unless you do what I'm about to do. And this, I can tell you, there's only a few surgeons in the world that are capable of doing this next step, which is to drill the bone spur out. And if you don't have a microscope, there's no way you're going to be able to do this. And by the way, we're literally a millimeter away from the spinal cord. So leave that alone. Nope. We're going to harvest this bone. Penfield, this time with a cup. It's the only time we use the cup. All right, I'm going to give you this bone, and you're going to save it. And we're going to put it back in. Now, how are you going to... No. Come on. I'm testing you to see if you're prepared. Don't disappoint me. Go on. That's you. It's a Penfield 4 every single time. That's what Carl should have taught you. Suck now. All right. Do not push down because the spinal cord is down there. Do you understand? So make sure you control your, your device. Suck. Yeah, we need a longer sucker for him. His paws are getting in the way. Let me have that, please. You should be able to suck without getting your hand in the way. You see what I'm doing? There's the herniation right there, folks. You see that? Uh -huh. All right, now we would not have gotten that out without drilling. Drilling is something that I do that's very unique. There's a few surgeons in the world that drill, pituitary, but I guarantee you there's no orthopedic surgeon that does spine surgery out there that drills. Okay? That's a neurosurgeon's territory. And I'll tell you something. Most neurosurgeons don't even do this. Shame on them, but they weren't trained properly. That's your herniation right there. You see that big blob? And it's caused a lot of inflammation. That's the dura down there right on top of the nerve root. That's on the patient's right side. We're going to get it out, but I have a feeling we need to get this bone spur out as well. Drew. We're not done getting the bone spurs out. Where the fuck is the pedal? You, know, you got to make sure the pedals are pointing in the right direction, okay? It's really not that hard, guys. going to be a seven millimeter cage. This is the neural foramen over here. All right, now you thought that was hard. The next step is even harder. Kerosene two, I mean a uh, curette two, curette two. I've got to take this posterior ligament. I've got to explore it and make sure we get all the herniation. So a lot of times you can't just stop now and you know pull this out and say I'm done. You actually have to get into the epidural space if you're not already there and you have to fish this herniation out and make sure you got it all. And this is really the hard part of the surgery. You don't want to damage the dura. The spinal cord is just below where I'm operating. Kerosene three. 
Come on, come on, take this and give me a Kerosene 3. You have a 2? Alright, I don't need it, just wipe. I may need it to have it available, but I don't need it this second. That's definitely a 3? Wow, oh, it seems bigger. Let me go down one size. So there's the, the posterior ligament. I'll need that curette too again in a minute. Huh? I may need the three, yeah, but I'm going to work with the two for a minute. Beautiful. I'm decompressing the nerve root now on the uh, patient's left side at C7T1. That was a herniation as well. That's the foramen right there, and there's some junk in there, like a herniation. See that? Just got rid of it. That's where the nerve is, and we just unpinched the nerve. The nerve is literally just below those little strands. So there's still a little bit of bone spur right here, a little bit of ridge, the osteophyte. Can you all see that? Yes. Sean? Yes, we can. Come on, wipe, Luis. There's the nerve down there with a little bit of vein on top of it. That's normal to see the nerve in the vein. Watch your eyes. I'll try to center it up a little bit. I don't say suction normally, but. All right, so we're at the back of the disc. A little bit blurry, I apologize. I'm removing the, uh, un the uncinate process, not the whole uncinate, but just part of it that's contributing to the stenosis. Huh? Let's see, we have a little bit of oozing. Where's our pressure? Oh, that's good. I'll try to improve the view, the adjusting the focus a little bit. That's better. By the way, we're broadcasting our surgery right now live around the world for free, no charge. Trying to uh, educate the world about the right way to do spinal surgery. The way we do it at Duke Spine with the very best results in the world. my answer. Let me have a curette too. Yeah, so there's a lot of scar tissue here from chronic inflammation from the herniation. That's a two? Really? Wow. And underneath this will be the dura mater. There's still some compression of the neural elements. Spinal cord nerve roots. You can see I have to apply a reasonable amount of force, Kerosene 2. This stuff doesn't want to come out easily. It's really a battle. That's a bone spur. Wipe. Good. That's the spinal cord down there. It's all scarred up from the chronic inflammation. That's the dura mater. We don't want to go through that. We want to stay what we call superficial to it. Nice job, Luis. Remember, this is the hardest of the, the three discs. It's really deep in the neck and really inferior down to the bottom by the feet. Very difficult to get to at C7-T1. 
So I'd say things are going really well from a surgery side. This is more of the herniation I'm taking out right now, so make sure you send this off. What is it, two? Yeah. There's the herniation, folks, right there. You see that? Now it's stuck down like it always is. Let me have a kerosene uh, three. But it was on top of the nerve right there, and it was squashing the nerve. So I think this patient's going to be very happy with his arm symptoms and his and his neck pain. There it is. I just got it out. There's the dura right there. It was sitting on top of the dura. I'm going to open the foramen. By the way, everything you've been watching since I told you earlier is very special. It's very difficult surgery. 90% of spine surgeons don't do this part. They would have been done by now without completing the decompression. And that's why a lot of patients, watch your eyes, don't get better with spine surgery is because the surgeon doesn't do the job properly. Is the table down? Yeah, we need it down a little more. Why are the lights on? Good, that's good. Eyes. <coughs> so what I'm doing is I'm looking out the neural foramen now on the right side, right here. And like I said, the scope we're using right now for you all to see, it's the same view that I have as a surgeon. Curette? And 90% of spine surgeons don't have this quality scope. They just do it with loops or even without loops. And so to really get great results, you have to bring the microscope in like I'm doing right now. I'm probing uh, by the nerve to make sure that it's unpinched completely. Kerosene, uh, two. I don't want to close this up and then come back in a week because we didn't do the job right. Three. Reversed. Yeah. Oh yeah, that was a great bite. Totally got really good unpinching there. Just opening the neural foramen up beautifully. We're going to need gel foam soaked in thrombin. And then we're going to need a seven millimeter tall cage right there. This is a foraminal decompression. It's the hallmark of good spine surgery when you're doing an ACDF. And again, probably about 90% of spine surgeons don't do it. Okay. So we've unpinched the spinal cord right here. We've unpinched the nerve on the right and the left. And the bigger herniation at this level, you could all see it was on the, what are you doing? These are supposed to be in half. You're trying to do something new? No, I just, I was watching a video and it looks like a No, side. that's wrong. Okay. It's a square, not a okay. rectangle. Right. It's fine for now, but don't, just cut those in half. All right, take, take. Yeah. All right, at this point, we've, we've done our decompressive discectomy. The end plate's ready for fusion. I've got to put the cage in. We've scraped the cartilage off the end plates on both sides, top and bottom. That way the bones will fuse together. And I'm going to put a cage in that's filled with autograft and allograft. The autograft is, yes, I'm waiting for it. The autograft is the patient's own bone. And the allograft is the demineralized bone matrix, DBM. So we mix them together to make a nice paste. And they go inside the bone graft, the uh, not bone graft, but the peak cage. This is the peak cage. It's a structural support. And you have to hammer it in. You should have to hammer it in. Now, most surgeons make the mistake here of putting in too narrow of a cage. And what happens is after the patient gets done with surgery, they go home and then their spine collapses down at that disc and they get horrible pain afterwards and pinched nerve because the spine collapsed. You have to put a big peak cage, tall. And I put a seven millimeter, which is perfect. Okay, so take the sucker please and suck. I'm gonna zoom out just a little so you all can see a little bit better. See that? 
So where the disc was, we took the disc out so we can get to the piece in the back that was pitching the nerve. And we put a cage in there made out of peak. Yeah, you can suck that. And then now we're going to get that post out from, C, from T1. Can I have the post remover, please? Yes, sir. Post remover and then bone wax on a kitty. Yes, sir. So you need that kittener with a peanut. I got it, sir. And I need bone wax on it. We're going to fill this little hole here. Yeah, okay. yeah. We can reuse that. Suck that hole. And now I'm going to put some sterile bone wax. Same thing the dentist puts on your braces. Pick up. To clog the hole. Hello? Yeah. Not fast enough for me. Take that. All right. There it is. We clogged the hole. Beautiful. Beautiful job. One of the hardest discs in the world to do. C7, T1, now we're going to go do the easier stuff, okay? I like to start with the harder stuff. So to move this retractor, I'm going to collapse it, and I'm going to attempt to move it north. I may be unsuccessful, in which case I'd have to come back in with my handheld retractors, and then we'd have to use the handhelds first to position these blades. But it looks pretty good so far. We're making good progress. The, remember, the ends of these blades are serrated. They're like little, little knives. Not knives, but kind of spiky things. They're, they're designed that way. Suck, suck, suck. They're designed that way to hold the muscle. You need to be sucking. Finger on the hole and suck that blood. All right. There's the next disc. Can you all see? I need the post, buddy. I, yes, I'm ready. I've been waiting. I need to line this retractor blade up so the center of the blade is pretty much lined up with the disc. This is coming out. Now what I'm retracting there is the longest coli muscle. One on the left, one on the right. All right, here we go. That's nice. Right there. Suck, please. All right, now I'm going to put this, this post... See, it has a sharp point. I'm right in the center. Give me a little wacky wacky. Not too hard. And again. Good. So the, the wacky wacky is hitting the, the post placer with a hammer. Why are we doing that? Because the bone in the front of the spine here is so hard, again, harder good that it won't allow the, the peg to go in it won't allow this little screw to go in so we have to break through the cortex sometimes in some patients not every patient but some patients breaking through the cortex allows us to screw it in and this post allows us to do something special it's called parallel distraction it basically lets us pull the bones apart in a parallel fashion so you don't get a collapsing in the back of the disc um, like you'd see if you don't if you don't do this. All right, I need a pen a pen filled one. Yes, Not that side, Luis. I told you before. That's only to harvest bone graft. All right. Now you see how we're distracting the disc. The disc kind of sucked back. Can you all see that disc there? Nice view. Yes, we all can. All right, 15 blade. That's the front of the disc in the front of the spine. We're going to take that annulus out. I cut it clean right off the bone. That's what you want. Not too far to the side. You don't want to hit the vertebral artery. Very bad form. You kill the patient. And then... We have a nice window into the disc. Take this. Then you use your pituitary to pull it out. I've done over a 1,000 of these surgeries, folks, and I've never had a major complication. The only complication I've, I've had was one patient in a 1,000 got a hematoma. That was about, oh, how many years ago? That was at the hospital, by the way, and that was 15 years ago. Yeah, yep, 
and the patient did fine. We had to take the hematoma out. I need the five curette. And then I've had a few patients where the screws got loose. Nothing to do with my technique. It was more the design of the plate that was being used at the time by uh, a company called Nuvasive. I complained, but they ignored me, so I changed companies. How long ago was that, like 12 years ago? Yeah, it's funny. How much business they lost as a result of not listening? Ignoring a surgeon who has concerns about safety and they lost <coughs> millions and millions of dollars. You need to wipe worth of uh, business as a result of their arrogance. Anyway, um, been using the same company now for 12 years and I've never had a problem with their plates and screws. So I won't just use anybody. I'll always vet the company to make sure, yeah, to make sure that they have very high quality implants. I'm not just going to put any implant on my patient. I've tried virtually every implant system out there. And quite honestly, uh, this company I'm using now, Alpha Tech, I hate them because I don't like the people except for Amy that work there. But I have to admit their implants are amazing and they do a great job. So does the uh, equipment that I use to put them in. Curette? Yes, it's always a five until I tell you smaller, okay? So we're using a curette, which is a shaver. We're scraping this disc material out, taking it off of the end plate along with the cartilage. You can see the cartilage right here. Any questions from the audience? We do have one. Sure. A viewer is wondering, what kind of microscope do you use? I use the very best microscope in the world. So one of our viewers says, what kind of microscope do you use? There's a couple of brands out there. The very best in the world is something called Carl Zeiss. Carl Zeiss. You've probably heard of them. They're known for their optics. German company. Of course, they make very high quality optics. I've used other microscopes like Leica, and they're just pieces of junk. They're cheaper. So a lot of hospitals, if they're going to buy a microscope, they buy a Leica. But the optics are not good. And it's really hard to use that microscope in surgery. So the very best is this microscope. Um, this is called the NC5. And NC5 is a neurosurgical microscope used for spine surgery and brain surgery. And this is the most advanced microscope they make. Of course, there's extra stuff you can put on it for doing brain tumor surgeries like uh, image guidance, fluorescence guidance, which we don't need because we don't take brain tumors out here at Duke Spine Institute. But as far as a spine scope goes, this is the top of the line in the world. And we spent over $200,000 for this microscope because it makes a difference in the patient's surgery and their outcome and their safety. A better microscope means a better surgical outcome because you get to do what you need to do very clearly. You can see it. And it also means um, less complications for the patient, more efficient surgery. So high quality things in surgery really translate to better outcomes for patients. So many places are going cheap. They're buying the cheapest this, the cheapest that. And that's why we built Duke Spine Institute is with Duke Spine Institute, I, I am the CEO, so I get to pick what we buy, and I don't go cheap. I go expensive and high quality. I mean, of course, I, I'm not allergic to making money, but I'm not going to go cheap on a piece of equipment and compromise my results. My results are everything. Three, for me, my surgical results define my career and who I am. And when I, yeah. Uh, when I when I uh, have bad results, it I don't feel good about myself. So I don't want bad results. So I always try to stack the deck in my favor to have the very best surgical outcome. So I buy the best equipment. I try to have the best people, the best medications, the best everything. And by doing that, by really investing in the very best of everything, 
you can give the patient the very best results. One of the biggest mistakes people think is, oh, if I get an ACDF at Duke Spine or if I get an ACDF somewhere else, it's all the same. You are 1,000% wrong. We don't kill patients here. We never have. You go other places, I hear st horror stories of people having major complications, being in the ICU, not even making it home. Happens all the time. There's a lot of sloppy surgeons out there. And there's a lot of hospitals that don't want to spend the money on um, good equipment because it costs a lot of money and they're, they're tight on their budget. So you see all these hospitals going out of business. There were probably 100 hospitals in 2019 that went out of business. Three. They're bankrupt. That's a four. They're going bankrupt because they don't have enough money. Well, do you think they're going to spend the money on buying the latest spine equipment and having the very best for their patients? No, of course not. They're barely surviving. And uh, people think hospitals make so much money. They don't. Some hospitals do. Very few, like less than 1% of hospitals make really good profits in the millions. But most hospitals, if they're lucky, they make a profit. That profit is usually around 2%, maybe 1% or 2% of their total collection. So people want to blame hospitals. They think they're greedy, but they really aren't. I've been uh, on the chief of staff for the hospital for years, and I know I've sit through all the budget committee meetings, and I know the financial pressure hospitals are under. And they're being put under pressure by the insurance companies. They don't want to pay for anything, the insurance companies. So they're constantly trying to get the hospitals to, to take less money. And of course, the hospitals, if they feel forced to take less money, they're going to, uh, they're going to take less money, but they're going to cut staffing, or they're going to cut medications, or they're going to cut investing in new equipment drill. Sure. And that's exactly what happens. I've seen the hospitals not update their equipment that is used in surgery. I've seen the hospitals cut back on staffing, so patients are not getting enough like nursing or care, um, cutting back on other protocols, pitu pituitary, and it results in uh, what I call compromised care. What the hospitals need to do is stand up to the insurance companies and say, no, we're not going to accept those lower payments because we want to give our patients the very best care. That's what Duke Spine does. We fight with the insurance companies all the time because they want to underpay. But we can't provide the best care when we're underpaid. We need enough money to give patients the very best. I'm going to harvest. Once again, I've drilled away the bone spurs at the back of the disc, and I'm keeping the bone spurs um, material, and we're using it in the bone graft to stimulate fusion. Should have that ready to go, Luis. You didn't suck that out, right? Good. I'm glad. Yeah. I like to use the patient's own tissue when available. It's safer for the patient. <sighs> All right, let's see what we got down there. Go ahead. Yeah, you can suck now. Don't push down. That's the spinal cord down there. Just nice and delicate. All right, so you can see where the herniation is, right? Can you all see it? Show us. It's right in the middle. See that right there, like that plug? Yep, no, you were right on it. Towards me, D right there. All right, curette. You all see that herniation there? It's a two, it's a two. When I drill and I get to the back of the bone spurs, it's a two. It's always a two. Ay, ay, ay. All right. This is all posterior longitudinal ligament, and there's the herniation. I need you to suck, please. Right where I'm working. Okay. I can't see. I need you to suck. All right, those are all fibers of the PLL, posterior longitudinal ligament. You need to get your knee out of the way and suck at an angle. Okay. You think you can do that? I don't hear a yes, sir. Suck, please. Suck where I'm working so I can see what I'm doing. Yeah. All right, let's go with that. That's the dura there. Again, the herniation is stuck down to the dura. That's where your spinal cord is, just under the dura. Yeah, three is good.
That's part of the herniation. Go ahead and suck. Very good. Good. So. Suck. Get your knee out of the way, please. Yeah, it's not easy, is it? This may be a, an eight. It may be an eight. What's the problem? Hey guys, what's going on? Yeah. But I like the room cool. Okay, I know you have to balance between my needs and, the, and what you feel is important for the patient, but um, if I'm sweating all over the wound, it doesn't help. Okay, Doc, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. You got another question there? Not at the moment. All right, Garrison. All right, so we're going out the left foramen here. Suck, keep your knee out of the way. Yeah, suck please. Stay out of my way. In and out, in and out. Just like a prize fighter. No, okay? You need to have the knee out of the way. You see the knee? I do not see the knee. Why? That's right. Is it magically out of the way or is it consciously out of the way? Consciously. Yeah, so you got to keep it out of the way. Okay. All right, so we've done a really good decompression at this point. We've gotten rid of the bone spurs. Um, I think, I'm thinking an eight. Bipolar, there's a little vein right there bleeding. There's two ways to deal with it. One would be gel foam soaked in thrombin. The other one, if you can do it safely, you can bipolar it. Okay, you see that? The bipolar does work. I feel really good. There's always veins right that run right here on both sides. This is looking good. Now this is a scarred up mess. Normally the dura is perfectly white, beautiful white, but the herniation has created so much inflammation. And here's where other surgeons get into trouble. I know that's dura right there in that little window. Okay, look at how the, the posterior ligament is scarred to the dura. Here's where tr surgeons get in trouble. They don't recognize the risk here. They puncture through here to get this junk out and they cause a spinal fluid leak. And a spinal fluid leak would just be devastating here. It's a huge problem. We don't want a spinal fluid leak if we can avoid it. In my 22 years of doing thousands of these discectomies, thousands, I mean about 3,000 of them. I've done a thousand surgeries, thousand plus surgeries, but each surgery is around two and a half discs. So I've done thousands of discectomies I've never had a spinal fluid leak, okay? So I don't want to start today, but I'm very cautious. I know my anatomy, and most surgeons don't see well enough because they don't have the microscope. Do you think you could see that without this microscope? No. And if you, if you go right there and puncture through with a curette, you're going to get a spinal fluid leak. Very common problem other surgeons have, but I've never had it because I have the very best equipment that I'm using. Okay, so it's just one example of why going somewhere where they have the best equipment is important. I'm thinking an eight. Don't pack it, just let me see it. Again, you want the biggest, tallest cage possible. Oh, eight's perfect. Yeah, let's pack it up. So if I go with a tiny little skinny cage in there, the bones are literally gonna collapse together on top of each other. That's gonna create horrible pain for this patient after surgery. 
And so many surgeons make that mistake of putting in too small of, a, of an inner body cage or graft. Again, this is the little technical details that separate my surgery at Duke Spine versus thousands of other spine surgeons that try to do the surgery properly. And they don't even realize they're doing something wrong most of the time. It's not that they're intentionally doing it wrong, it's that they have no idea what they're doing is wrong. No, the gel foam, the gel foam stays. Mallet. Okay. You shouldn't have to hammer hard to get it in. It should be just snug. That's perfect. Absolutely perfect. Okay. You don't want to hammer hard and you can't just slide it in. If you're sliding it in, you're too small. You need a taller cage. All right. So that's two out of three done. We got one more to go. Penfield. Let me have it, please. Oh, you got it right, Louise. You're learning. This man can learn. All right, you see that right there? We don't want that down there. See that? You should be sucking that out. That's a piece of cartilage from the end plate of the last disc. Hey, okay, bone wax goes in, makes a perfect little, you know, plug, plug. What's this, folks? What's this? Isn't that pretty? That's a blood vessel, okay? Most likely, it could be a vein, but it could also be an artery, but I don't see it pulsing. Arteries tend to have thicker walls. To me, this looks more like an artery or an arterialized vein. It doesn't look like a typical vein. It's too thick walled for a vein, but it's not pulsing either. So I don't know if it's an artery or vein either way. I'm trying to leave it alone. All right, gel foam. So I'm going to pack a little gel foam into the side of that cage. Thank you. These are perfect size, by the way. Yeah, that's, that's the right thing to do. So I'm going to put some gel foam here and over there. Suck over there, please. So, Jason, what do you think, huh? Oh, besides that, come on. We already know it's, it's difficult. All right, good. Yeah. Maybe you'll take a liking to it. Uh-uh. Leave those guys alone. All right, this time I am going to take the retractor blades out, okay? Because I don't want to slide up further because I might do some damage to the muscle, to the underside of the longus coli muscle, okay? And I don't want to do that. So I'm just going to pop them out. And I'm going to show you. See the serrated teeth right there? That's what I'm talking about. Okay? We don't want to chop, chop, chop things up. Is it pulsing now? Well, it could be the tissues it's attached to that are pulsing. But it could be a, a, a vessel, an artery as well. I agree with you. It's pulsing now. But is it pulsing because the carotid is pulsing? So let's see the... Let's see the lipless. Just to orient you since we're here. Okay, let me have a pointer. There's the carotid artery right there. Pointer, come on, come on. Penfield for, it's for God's sakes, Luis, you should have it up and ready to go. This looks like it may be coming off the carotid artery. Hard to say. It would be a thyroidal branch. Shame on you. That's the carotid artery right there. Now it's underneath what's called the carotid sheath, which is a, f a fascial layer around it. And then you got your internal jugular vein down in there. And you got the vagus nerve in there. All right. And I don't think that's the vagus, but it's close. The anesthesiologist is getting nervous that I'm playing around with the carotid. He's looking at the blood pressure cuff anxiously. But the good news is I've been here thousands and thousands of times and I'm, I'm not an idiot. I actually know what I'm doing. Yeah, that does look like a little artery, doesn't it? A little muscular artery. So on the other side, we have the esophagus down here. See that? Right there, folks, that's the esophagus. Right here, esophagus. 
and then the trachea is in front of it. I can feel it there. So we're doing pretty good. We're going to get to the last disc right now. Watch your eyes. Any questions for me? Lipped. Lipped. Suck, please. Uh-huh. Suck. Good. Up in here, right there. That's you. Any questions? We do have one. one Anybody? Of the, go ahead. One of our viewers is wondering, how successful is PRP therapy versus regular spine surgery like this? Do you recommend trying PRP suck, suck, therapy suck. if DLDR is not an option in addition to traditional? I think that's a great question. I think I like the question. Suck, please. All the blood clots. Where are you sucking? We're not working down here. We're, suck we're working here. You need to get all this red out of here. All right. So the question was, suck here, right, right where I'm looking, right here, okay? The question, right here, right here, right, right here, right here, yes. The question is, if a patient has a herniated disc and they can't have Duke laser disc repair, would PRP be a better option than like a fusion like this or artificial disc? And it's a great question, but let me, I'm gonna make it very simple. PRP has one purpose. It is to treat pain, okay? These surgeries that we're doing right here are usually not to treat pain, though they can be very successful at treating pain. That's mine or his? Yeah. I think we need 4550. So if, if this patient just had pain, like neck pain, then I think PRP could be a very good option. Dr. Patel could do an intradiscal PRP or a facet joint PRP. That would be very good. That would be number one if they can't have Duke laser disc repair. But if we're treating pinched nerve, which we happen to be in this case, or pinched spinal cord from a herniation, then PRP is not appropriate. PRP, you need to get your hand out of the way. You need to move north, bucko. Let's go. Yep. Oh, yeah. Get it out of my way. There we go. Nice. See how easy that was? Hold that. If we're treating just pain in the neck, then PRP is perfect. Hold it down on the spine. Hold it right like that. Don't do this, don't do this, don't do this or this. Hold it right there. All right. But when you're talking about pinched nerves or pinched spinal cord, PRP is not appropriate. PRP will not fix the pinching of the nerve or spinal cord. Okay? PRP is used to treat inflammation. It's not used to treat compression. PRP in somebody who has radiculopathy, which is a pinched nerve with weakness or numbness, would be inappropriate. Uh, I should be able to snap in. Are you moving? Yeah, don't move. You need a, you need a, because this thing won't snap in if you move. All right, come off. Yep, there you go. There we are. In case you're wondering what we're listening to this morning, we're listening to Tangerine Dream. It's an older band from a long time ago. I think from the 80s. Suck, please. 70s. 70s, 70s and 80s. But they made uh, music that was quite advanced for their time. All right, I really need you to suck all the red stuff. The red stuff is blood, as you know. I can't really see what I'm doing if you don't suck it. All right, let me see here. I'm going to need a bovie for that. So that's where we had that giant bone spur in the front of the spine last time when we started the case. When I say last time, I mean earlier. And I've got to peel some of this tissue off. Yeah, you can still see there's a bit of a spur there. Okay. And this is the front of C5. So this is the last disc that we're gonna fix, but this is still too much bone spur. Okay, too much bone spur. I will never get a plate to sit properly on the spine with that. So take this and give me the drill. We have another question. Yeah, I'll take the question. One of our viewers is wondering, how much pain will this patient be in after surgery? How will much pain? Will, how much pain will they be in and will they need assistance breathing and eating? All right, so I don't expect them to be in very much pain at all. Typically, they'll have a 3 out of, out of 10 for neck pain. 
what I worry about with all my patients that have this type of surgery, suck please, is um, difficulty swallowing. Okay, and that you can never predict who's going to have trouble swallowing. So I'm contouring the front of the spine. So if the patient has too much trouble swallowing because it hurts too much, then they're going to have to be treated for dehydration because they're not going to be able to swallow enough liquids. I'm not worried about food. Nobody dies from starvation in a week unless they're severely debilitated before. But people do die of dehydration. And that's a serious risk. So we are generally very careful with how we do the surgery. As a matter of fact, it's a great question because most surgeons believe, post, that they actually have to do a smaller incision to make the swallowing problem not so bad. But the reality is when you do a smaller incision, hold on, the swallowing problem gets much worse. Go ahead. A little more. Good. So the key with these surgeries, and I used to be one of those surgeons that believed, oh, smaller is better. But the smaller the incision, the more you have to retract. Not enough. Hold on. Okay, go ahead. Let me see. That may be enough. You just need the threads to grab. This is called the self-drilling um, and self-tapping. Uh, I don't think I have it, Luis. No. Self-drilling and self-tapping screw. Hold on. Because it just needs a little bit of help, but then it can actually drill itself into the bone with twisting, and it can tap the hole itself. No, still not good enough. This is very hard bone. This is where that bone spur was. This is abnormally what we call sclerotic hard bone. So, but it's going well. This is our last disc. Once we're done with this, we're going to put the metal plate in. So don't go away if you're watching. It's going to get really exciting soon. If it wasn't already exciting for you. And Jason thought, gosh, that was hard. Wait till you get to put the plate in. It's hard too. The fun isn't over, Jason. Lots to learn today, sir. Huh? Lots to learn today, sir. Oh, yeah. All right, now. This is not going in. There we go. Okie dokie. Now, watch how I distract this open and watch the disc. You see how the disc got bigger? Like it spread apart. Okay, watch your eyes. I'm going to reposition the microscope. Here we go. So I'm spreading these posts apart, and that's going to allow me to do the discectomy, get the part in the back as well, but also it allows me to put a bigger cage in. So if a surgeon, a lot of surgeons don't use this tool. It's called a parallel distractor. <coughs> they don't know to use it. They don't know how to use it. I was taught how to use it when I was a resident in uh, Gainesville at the UF in, Ga in Gainesville, so University of Florida. It was pretty standard for us to use this distractor. And uh, it's probably the one thing Dr. Pat Jacob taught me in my residency, the one useful thing that he taught me. All right, there's that degenerated disc. You see how grungy it looks, collapsed. It's pretty damaged. You see kind of a hole down there. We shouldn't see any of that normally. So this is a badly damaged disc. It's kind of dried up. We call it degenerated. This is a degenerated disc. And in the very back of this degenerated disc will be a herniation, okay? And that's what we're going to get is a herniation. It's pushing on the nerves, the spinal cord, wipe. Nice job, Jason. That's beautiful. You get to grab the pituitary, Jason. Okay, that's what your job is, is to suck and use the pituitary to take pieces out. Take your time. Go on. Give Jason the pituitary. Yep, and you just keep going in and out with that pituitary, removing pieces, giving them to Luis. And, whoa, now just real careful. When you want to go for something over here, you got to make sure you see it. 
you can't be grabbing a vein or an artery or something. You can suck that. Okay, that won't come out. Try to grab that. That should come out with your pituitary. Nice job. That's cartilage there I'm scraping off. Watch it. Don't block my view. You're allowed to do lots in there, but you can't grab something you're not supposed to grab, and you can't block my view. Now, if the piece is, if the piece is like way over here and you can't see that well, you use your sucker to kind of pull it into view, and then you can you can grab it out if you need to. All right, let me have a kerosene uh, four. four. Yes, You're doing great. Keep going. Yep. I was talking to Jason. Yes. You're I not. You're not. Me. You're not doing great. <laughs> no, you're doing. You're doing great too. Thank you. Right now you are. Okay. Why are you leaving this bone in here? Bone no, it's not you. It's Luis. Hey, watch your tube. Don't let it come into my field. I'm removing that bone spur at the bottom of the vertebral body above. Okay, that would be number five, C5. That bone spur is bad. It's going to block our ability to get a bigger cage in, and it blocks our view. So there's two good reasons to remove it. Plus, it's not supposed to be there. It's unnatural in the sense that it's, it's grown there as a result of instability at the segment. It's a sign of instability, abnormal movement of the disc. It's the body's effort to stabilize the joint on its own by just forming what's called a hypertrophied bone and ligaments in an effort to stabilize that disc, that joint, because the instability is pinching nerves. Did you all know that your bodies try to stabilize unstable joints? That's where you get arthritis and bone spurs, particularly bone spurs, thickened ligament, thickened capsule. Okay, so this is number five, six. Let me have a curette. Again, we're near the back of the disc. I need a smaller one when I get to the back of the disc, the three. So it's a six for the front, a three for the back, and then once I drill, it's a two. Okay? Can you remember that? Good. If I can remember it, you can remember it. I demand a lot from the people I work with because I want the surgeries to go perfectly well for the patient and I can't make that happen on my own. I need help. Come on. Stop using the dirty area. Go to a clean area and wipe. That's what happens when you use the same area of the cloth. Now, some surgeons will leave this disc there on the side. That's a big mistake. Because when they put the cage in later, they're going to push that down on the nerve. And then the patients have, what do you know, nerve symptoms after the surgery they didn't have before. Because the surgeon basically did a sloppy job. Yes, it takes more time. Everything you see me doing right now is absolutely necessary to have the very best outcome. I don't do anything unnecessary because I don't like wasting time, personally. And I don't want to expose the patient to curette 2. I don't want to expose the patient to unnecessary risk. So whenever I put something in and do something, like right now what I'm about to do, is I believe is completely necessary for the surgery to be done properly. Um, I've seen surgeons just put instruments in not really knowing what the heck they're doing. <coughs> it's pretty shocking. Every single time I go in with an instrument, I I'm, I'm have a goal I'm achieving. Right now it's getting this piece of uh, cartilage and disc out from that lateral recess. I don't want a four. Want a three, I want a two. 
Are you watching? It's a narrow disk space. Uh, narrow disk space, you need a, I need a, probably a, I don't know, a three maybe. Yeah. So this is the neural foramen on the left side at C5, 6. And it's looking pretty good. There's a little bit of material here, herniation in the foramen. But that's about it. You can see the nerve root right there. Let me have a two curette. The nerve root is literally right here, right there. And it's going out the foramen there. That's perfect. So that side's good. Now I got to get to the other side and make sure it's unpinched too. Now this disc here doesn't have as much bone spur as the bottom ones, the lower ones, but it does have this huge herniation right here. You can see it's pushing on the spinal cord. Let me have a three. You can see the spinal cord down there right where he's about to uh, reverse, but see the dura down there, right? Uh, it's a little bit too big. Let me have a two back. See the dura down there, just below my biter? There it is, beautiful. All right, so I've opened this up as much as I can. Hmm, I wonder if we should have put our posts a little bit higher. I think I need to. Let me take the post out, bone wax. Suck, suck, suck. Careful now. Two, Terry. Don't suck that, that soft tissue. Actually, hold the soft tissue there. I'm going to bipolar it. Suck it again, bipolar. Bipolaring is basically just cooking tissue. The reason I'm cooking that is I can see a vein in there, and that thing is going to bleed later. Bone wax. Mallet. See if I can get a better purchase. Any questions from our audience? None others so far. Huh? There are no others so far. Nice, Luis. No others. Great. Let me have a pen field or something. You won't. You don't want to ignore the soft tissue right here. It's full of blood vessels, and if you tear something while you're putting your instrument in, it's going to start bleeding down on you. I've learned those lessons a long time ago. All right. So yeah, we were getting pretty good distraction before. You're not touching your eyepieces, right? Good. This is a pretty collapsed disc. It's definitely not going to be an eight. Sucks up. No, I need a drill next, probably. Get in there and suck it. Yep. Pituitary. Come on out. I can't see. This is going to be a six cage, probably. Is what I'm thinking. Drill. All right, once again, we'll drill away the bone spurs at the back. There aren't that many. That'll help unpinch the spinal cord and nerve. That's all bone graft. We can use it for our fusion because we need bone graft for fusion. I don't like to be wasteful, so I don't want to throw it away. A lot of surgeons just throw it away. This doesn't make sense. Just carelessness. Suck, suck. Yep. All that bone graft I just drilled has stem cells in it. I need you to suck that piece of disc right there. Yep. Try to, no. You don't see the one right in the corner there, buddy? 
Harrison. You don't see this guy right here. I need probably a three. Yeah. Anybody ever watch the old Arnold Schwarzenegger movie, Drew? Take it. Total Recall. I watched. I watched that when it first came out and compared it to the new one. I like the old one better. <sighs> Suck, please. Uh huh. Okay. Suck. All right. No. Yeah, down there. Let's see what we got. Harrison 2. Suck again. Okay. Try not to move the retractors. Suck. When I come out, you suck in. You got to suck where I'm biting, not up higher. Three, maybe? Right, let me try one more two bite. Three. Suck. If you're not sucking, I can't see what I'm doing. You got to get in there and suck it. Suck. Uh -huh. Suction. Come out, please. You can't twist it and come out if it's narrow. You have to straighten it out so it's parallel to the end place and then remove it. Suck. You're doing good, but I need you to get a little deeper because you're leaving a layer of blood that makes it impossible to see. Your sucker is clogged. just about ready. This will be a six. See the vein there, guys? Lateral sulcus. I think the spinal cord is well decompressed. The neural foramen is well decompressed. There's really nothing left. We're done. Gel foam. Alright, gel foam has thrombin on it. It basically helps stop the bleeding. The bleeding we have here is just from veins at the back of the disc. It is low pressure, very easy to stop, you're done. We need a cage. This will be our last cage that we put in. Mallet. Suck please. Hello McFly. Perfect. Get in there and suck. What are you waiting for? An invitation? When the patient's not bleeding, that's when you don't need to suck. How's that? Over here? 
So like here. Move. All right, take. Pretty much done with that discectomy. Now some surgeons don't put a metal plate in, but if you don't put a plate in, the patient's definitely gonna be back with horrible pain um, from instability. So once you've taken those discs out, you're obligated, in my opinion, to stabilize. And the most common way to do that, Luis, nothing. The bone, the bone wax is barely hanging on. It's supposed to be on firmly. Otherwise, I can't position it properly in the hole. Post remover is next, Louise. Post remover. So it's important, don't suck that gel film out, that you stabilize this area. When you have three herniated discs and you've done three discectomies and cages, you really need a metal plate. There's no doubt about it. I've been putting metal plates in for 22 years and honestly, I think they're necessary in these types of surgeries. I would not do a surgery like this without putting some kind of a stabilization like a plate. All right, at this point, we're going to take this out. Yeah. You don't want to get the bone wax in here, here, because it's going to block the uh, fusion. You can't fuse through bone wax. Now this stuff here might push the plate away from the spine. I don't think it's too bad. We're going to take a look at that. We're taking the retractor out. Eh, no, we're going to leave it in. Let's see what we can do here. I'm going to move it south a little bit. So this is going to be the hard part, Jason. I'm not going to lie to you. I need irrigation and suction, Jason. What we're going to need to do is we're going to need to size the plate. Now, thank God Amy has a formula. I need a, yeah, irrigate, irrigate. Yeah, you need to irrigate. All right, let me have a drill. I'm going to contour that vertebral body a little bit. The problem, folks, if you don't contour these vertebral bodies in the front, you're gonna, the bone spurs are going to push the plate off the spine, and you're not going to get a nice, snug fit. Can't tell you how many times I've seen that done by other surgeons. Tuck, please. I don't know why you're sitting there perched like a, an eagle waiting for an invitation to a meal. You should be sucking as I'm working. All right, let's look down south. Suck down south. Let's have a handheld lipless. Okay. We're going to need to look down here. Yep. Look over here. Look down there. All right, let's get a plate. Actually, I need to clean those bone spurs off there. Let me have a lipped drill. Here you go. You're going to hold this right here. You're going to protect the esophagus and trachea right there like that. Nice job. Hold it there. Do not move. Okay? See that bone spur, folks? That has to go. These bone spurs push the metal plate out of place. No. That looks pretty good. I'm happy with that. Yeah, we'll take the plate. All right, you can come out. Lipless. Pick up. Do not move the retractor when you come out. Why would you do that? Come on. I said lipless. Sweet Jesus. Surgery is hard enough without you guys following orders.
say with you guys following orders. Just trying to make it more challenging for me, huh? All right, the way I line the holes up is the right way to do it. A lot of surgeons put too long of a plate. I try to keep the plate as small as possible, as short as possible. So that's kind of good for the top, but I don't know that we're good at the bottom. Okay. Suck the hole, please. Actually, the bottom looks pretty good. Suck the hole on my side? Yeah. I'm trying to line it up. Beautiful. Ah, we're right on the edge there, you know? But honestly, I think we're going to be okay. Because the plate will flatten out and push south. I think we're actually okay. We're right on the cusp of being too short, but that's right where I like it. Let me have the drill. All right, so I'm going to anchor the middle of the plate. I always anchor and pin the middle of the plate first. Because what happens is you're going to reduce the spine to the plate. That's something a lot of surgeons don't understand that concept. It basically means I'm going to bring the spine to the plate. That's exactly what happens. You see how there's a gap between the plate and the, the bone right there? Do you think the plate bends or do you think the spine comes up to the plate? Of course the spine comes up to the plate. This plate's not going to bend. So in that relationship between the plate and the spine, you're going to get something called reduction. And reduction in orthopedic spine terminology means you're changing the shape of the bony anatomy and you're bringing, you're bringing it back into normal alignment. You're reducing the deformity, reducing it back to normal. Give me a, it's always a lipless handheld, okay, at this stage. That's what I've been asking for over and over again. Suck down here. I've got to make sure we don't trap the esophagus underneath the plate. There's a lot to worry about other than you guys doing what you're supposed to do. Let me have a drill. These are what, 14 or 16? 16 because he's a male. Yeah, men, we have longer screws. Their vertebral body are actually wider. I don't know if I'm happy with that one. Let me have the hand lipless. Let's look down south. Luis, put it in my hand so I can use it, please. Yeah. Uh, let's take that one out. What do I need to get it out? So painful. Come on, guys. Let me have a lipless and a pickup. Let's go faster. Mm -hmm. We have a Find question. It. Hello, McFly. Yeah, I'll take the question. We have a viewer who says, I have been doing RFAs for many years now, and I've been wanting more permanent relief. I have to get them done every four to six months because the relief doesn't last very long. 
Is there any permanent solution for facet joint pain? Yes, there is a permanent solution. Hold this. There is a permanent solution to facet joint pain, for sure. If you have facet joint pain, um, if that truly is your diagnosis, the permanent solution is a fusion. Fusion, that's the only solution available today in 2020. Duke laser disc repair only fixes disc pain. But I don't know where you are or you know if it's possible for you to come see us, but I would strongly recommend before you do a fusion, suck the upper hole. Actually, the lower hole is fine. I would strongly recommend you come see me and let me verify that it is facet joint pain. If you have a medial branch block and it takes your pain completely away, then you're right. It likely is facet joint, facet joint pain. In which case, a spinal fusion is the way to go. <laughs> the alternative would be to remove your facet joint and replace it with a new facet joint. But we don't have artificial facet joints that work. People have been experimenting with it for 20 years or longer, maybe even longer than 20 years, probably in Europe longer. And we've never su been successful at doing facet joint Let's go north. Go north. Think you can manage that? Um, but nobody's ever been able to design a facet joint replacement system made out of metal or plastic, whatever, usually metal. No one's been able to design one that actually works. They all fail. They all break. They mostly get loose at the bone um, implant interface. So where the, the uh, fake facet joint, the metal facet joint, can you please suck? Come on, Jason. Do I need to wake you up every few minutes? Okay. All right. Very good. Let's go with the next one. You doing good there? Yes, that's what I want to see. I go at an angle up at the top and down at the bottom. See how the screw is going up into the bone? Right. No, it's, it, it can be anywhere from 20 to 40 degrees, but, okay. but I don't like to go straight across. I like to go up into the bone. And what that does, since it's a variable angle, it actually moves over time and it allows some settling. You need the settling to have compression. You want compression at the bone implant interface between the bone and the cage. That way, um, the bone graft will be under compression and then it'll fuse. If you don't have compression from settling, then uh, you won't get a fusion. That's not the only reason you don't get a fusion. Sometimes people don't get, where's the screw? Sometimes people don't get a fusion because of other reasons, like poor bone metabolism or quality, or they're on anti-inflammatories when they shouldn't be after surgery. So people should not take anti-inflammatories three months after a fusion. You know that, right? Yeah. Nice and snug. Snug as a bug. We got two more at the bottom, so go ahead and shift to the bottom. Those are gonna be a little bit harder to do, but I just need your help. Yep, okay, suction. All right, now we're gonna pick one side, then the other. We'll start on my side. You got to suck and retract at the same time. Yep, nicely done. Perfect. Look at that. So when you look through that window at the top and bottom of the plate, you should always see half bone, half cage. That means you're in the perfect spot. The problem most surgeons make is they put too long of a cage, I mean too long of a plate, and they end up over time settling, the patient settles, 
and then the, the next thing you know the plate is rubbing on the disc above or below causing that disc to wear out it's just poor surgical technique so when you look through the ends the bookends of these plates for the anterior cervical plates you should see half graft or cage and half um, bone from the vertebral body above or below beautiful job go ahead and suck the hole I got to make sure there's no esophagus in there yeah perfect and there is none that's our last screw going in folks and then we're going to be cleaning up and closing we should be closing latest 30 minutes doctor We're going to get a fluoro shot next. We have fluoro here. Ready to go. Come out. All right. I wonder if I can reduce this. The way you reduce is a little twist here and a little twist there. You slowly bring the spine back to the plate, to the back of the plate. We've been able to save this little artery right here. We didn't have to sacrifice it. All right, irrigation, no. We're not done. I like to put some irrigation fluoro. Don't suck it. Leave it. So we're done with our discectomy. We're done with our cages. We're done with the plate. If you're going to have a fusion, this is absolutely the very best technique there is and you can see it's impossible to see what we're doing without a microscope okay come on in table up please up 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 watch the scope no 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 don't come any closer back off what should you be doing huh you should be rotating your arm you don't need to have it straight up and down as you come in it's not in straight up and down it's in and rotate as you're coming in yes yep i need that pulled down yep keep going keep going good get that thing straight across are you straight across i mean are you Okay, so let me know when you're ready. I'm going to pull the shoulders. I think we're a little high on the table. I dropped the table about an inch. Go ahead. Yeah, let's see where we are. Beautiful. All right, come south. Two, three, four, five, six. Yeah. All right, well, the screws go right to the back of the vertebral body. I'm not concerned that they're too long. I'm happy with them. I would like for you to get a, a shot through the shoulders. So can you come further south? Can I get an arm pull? Do we have um, straps on? Uh, no. <laughs> no, I don't need your help. I needed you to help me before by putting straps on shot. All right. Uh, I wish I could see that level below. I need to see something below. Can you come a little bit lower? Shot. All right. That looks good. Yep. Once again, the screws go all the way back to the back of the vertebral body, but they don't penetrate. They're right at the back cortex screwing in, which gives it even greater strength. All right, that's the best we can do. So table down, fluoro out. I'm going to bring the microscope back in. And those are 16s, right? Yes, sir. Yes,
Okay, so let's get the retractors table down. Good. A little more. Just a little bit. All right. I need the retractor. All right, now take that. We're going to need a lot of irrigation. I need a bipolar. Where's our blood pressure? Irrigation. That's perfect. Suck. So what we're going to do now, folks, is we're going to start closing this case up. North. North. Move north. There you go. Good job. Move south. Yes, you're learning. I love it. Bipolar. Stay in there. I didn't say come out. You don't come out till I tell you to come out, okay? Yes, All right, so I need you sucking for me. Now we're going to be coagulating little bleeders. They're like a little vein right there. You see that? What happens is if we don't do this after surgery, the patient will wake up and then have a hematoma, which will be bad. And I really want the blood pressure under strict control, okay? In recovery. Doctor? Well, that's not the answer I'm looking for. Is there a reason why you wouldn't be able to? There won't be much pain. Wipe. Well, that's fair for you to say that. North. We're not just going to let the blood pressure run up, though. We're going to keep it under control. I want it like 120, maybe maximum. 110, 120 would be nice. All right, so let me re angle this. Watch your eyes. When you see my hands come up, you need to watch your eyes, okay? okay. We're going to look up north. That's beautiful. Suck, please. This is a common place to bleed right here in the corner. I need you to suck for me. Now your side. Right here. Uh-huh. You should be sucking this juice around where I'm working. Toe in, just slide down. There you go, good job. I want to see this edge right here. I need to see the fascial edge, yes. Beautiful. Now what structure runs inside this muscle here that we need to be worried about? Anybody know? Let's see if our audience knows. What important nerve runs inside the longest coli muscles, one on each side. Keep your knee back, no, we're not ready to go that far. We wanna be right about here. Who said what? Who said that? Who? Give that man a prize. How do you know that? There you do know, you, you've been listening to me talk about it for s in surgery for probably years. Good job, man. Good job. You're paying attention. I love it. Sympathetic trunk. Hey, I want to see the fascia above the muscle. You need to lift, come higher, and go back in. There. That's what I need to see is this white stuff, okay? That's where the veins are. You have to show me that. North. Stay above the fascia, like I just showed you. There you go. Uh huh. South. Wipe. Yeah. What? Um, yeah, that's, that's fine. What were you going to do if we had two cases? I, I wouldn't 
Understood. All right. Suck here. Uh. All right, I need to see down there. So you need to get under the esophagus, re-grab gently, very gently. Show me this area, suck. Mm -hmm. I need to see this down here. Let me have it. Okay. Any more questions? Hold it here. Pushing down. Suck, please. Get your fingers out of the way. Yep, show me. Good. Perfect. Any more questions there, Sean? Suck, please. None so far. All right, well, hopefully you've enjoyed our surgery presentation, live spinal surgery from Duke Spine Institute and the Surgery Center of Vieira where the surgery is taking place today. Our patient had three bad discs, herniations with pinched nerve, pinched spinal cord, neck pain, arm symptoms with weakness, numbness, and we just completed or we're getting ready to complete a anterior cervical discectomy infusion. We've put in a metal plate, screws. Again, I like long screws. They go all the way to the back of the vertebral body and even poke in a little bit so you can get better purchase. That way they don't get loose and come out. Um, everything went pretty well. Better than I expected, to be honest with you. Because I didn't expect to be able to do the bottom disc because doing that bottom disc is really hard to do. C7, relax on that artery, relax, come back. Come back here, hello. Yeah, Ooh. Arteries can take a lot of abuse. All right, let me see what we got here. It's just from the discectomy. Hello, white please. All right, looking good. Looking good, no bleeding. It's beautiful. Irrigation, let's do one more irrigation. Stay where you are. Suction. I'm very happy, no bleeding. It's a dry wound, it's perfect. Uh, what's that? Suck that again. Let me have a bipolar. No, oh, it's right here, right underneath this. Right here, right here, there you go. When I see stuff like that, I say, okay, we need to get that. Very good, very good. All right, so at this point, we're ready to put in our <coughs> uh, Depamedrol topical. Okay. Don't suck, don't suck this. Stay where you are, now come out. Yep. Perfect. Okay. Beautiful, Don, beautiful surgery. Now we're gonna close this wound up. I start by closing up something called the uh, platysma muscle. We talked about it earlier. You don't need to close anything deeper than the platysma muscle. The platysma muscle is right here. Everything okay, guys? I don't want to poke that vein if I can avoid it. This is a pop-off? Uh, this is for the skin or the platysma? No, that's a platysma. This is a 
Hey, I don't. I don't. That's a monofilament for sure. This is hey, I don't. I don't use a monofilament on the platysma. It's three O so resorbable. That's what I use. The one I just gave you back. Oh. We're just getting everything right, folks. Needle down. Get that needle. Don't let somebody get hurt with it. Not you. Luis has to touch it. You have another? Wait, wait, wait. It's not a it's not a running stitch. It's a one then another then another. Each one is a pop off. Okay. This is too long. This is too long. Yes. No, we're we're not gonna. You, you don't understand. These running sutures cost a lot more money than the individual sutures. Now you're taking the runners and we're popping them off inappropriately. Just give me the suture. Get the right stitches, Luis. Mm, hold on, I need that other one. Well, cut it. No, no, no. Let's turn the head, please. He's rotated too much. He's looking that way. Keep them neutral. Can you do that? What's keeping them from staying neutral? I think he's neutral right now. He's touching the donut. I agree with you, but what's is he seems to be wanting to turn back again. No?
Let me have some AdSense. AdSense. AdSense, AdSense. Hold this. Oh, tighter, tighter, come on. Not there, here. This is where you should be holding it. Do you not see the crosshatch mark right here? Do you not see it here? Right here. Okay, I'm trying to come out. 
and go in on the other side in the same place. I'm trying to line it up. You have to help me do that. At the same time, hold tension. got too much tension on the suture. Scissor. Wet dry, scissor. Where's the wet dry? Where's the wet dry? Is it wet dry? Yeah, the wet dry. That's barely moist. I want wet. <sighs> Where's the dry? Dry, 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 wet, dry. You know what wet dry means? Yeah, that's right.
Pick up. What do you think I need? You don't you don't know the steps of the surgery, Luis? Do you I mean seriously? Didn't you do a lot of these with uh Augusto and No, uh, uh. I thought you put the stereo strips on the patients. Oh well, yeah. So what do you use? Yeah, I use that. Yeah. So why are you asking me what pickup I need? No. What do you call these? Really? Then what are those up there? They're called bayonets, Luis. They're all pickups, okay? But you should know what pickup is appropriate for what stage of the surgery we're doing. Well, as you get older as a surgeon, your surgeries are supposed to get easier for you, but the surgery itself isn't hard but my staff love to make it difficult. I'm gonna call it um, 15 mils EBL. We always send disc material. Where's the rest of the paperwork that goes with this chart? There's supposed to be a packet that goes with it. Where is the packet? All right, I'll be happy to come and answer questions. Let's put a collar on the patient. They don't already have one. Where's the rest of the paperwork? I hope there's no patient name on here. Okay, that's fine. Okay, I'm going to head over there.
Hey, Dr. Arjuk Majin here. And for those of you who watched this surgery, you watched a anterior cervical discectomy infusion. It's a 100-year-old surgery, but it's done different by every surgeon. And I have developed a technique that is the absolute very best in the world. Um, there are other surgeons that have good technique as well. But there are complications that occur with the surgery that are quite often and frequent, one of them being trouble swallowing, another one being damage to the soft tissues in the neck, whether it's the trachea, esophagus, carotid artery, jugular vein, muscles. Um, and then there are complications that come from the hardware. Misplaced screws, screws that get loose and come out, metal plates not put on properly, it's too long or too short. So there are those type of complications, and there are also complications from the surgery not being done properly with respect to decompressing the nerve root or spinal cord, leaving residual disc material, leaving the nerves pinched, leaving the spinal cord pinched, and not treating all the pain generators. So there are surgical technique issues that affect the actual spine. There are surgical technique issues that affect the, the front of the neck where you go through, and there are... Um, you know, basically bad complications that can result from those technique issues. So all anterior cervical discectomy infusions are not the same. Every single surgeon in the world does them differently. You will never see exactly the same surgery done by any two surgeons. And those technical nuances that are done differently can make a huge difference in how the patient does. So the point here is very simple. Don't expect to get great results from every surgeon that does this surgery. Be very selective as to who you go to. And unfortunately, most surgeons these days won't tell you the truth about their results. They'll lie to you. And as a result of that, you're going to be misled, and you might end up making a decision to have surgery somewhere where you have a bad complication. Just in our town here in Brevard County, Florida, in NASA, we have a, another surgery center and, and spine group that's located pretty close by. And um, I just saw a patient a couple weeks ago where they operated on the wrong disc. They ended up doing surgery at uh, the wrong disc. And honestly, the patient had a pretty thin neck, so it's really hard to do that. Uh, but somehow they managed to do that. Also, the surgeon went in through the side of the neck rather than through the front of the neck, and I've never seen that. That is absolutely the wrong technique. I mean, I've never seen anything so bad. It was literally a butcher shop. Um, you know, I, I can respect surgeons doing things differently if they're doing it to get a better outcome, but when they do things different because they don't know what they're doing, that can cause serious patient harm. And I just caution everyone out there, be very, very careful. Go to a surgeon who's really good and has great results and has a great reputation. Uh, as you can tell from my surgery, um, you know, it's done very clean with minimal blood loss. We had less than 20 mils of blood loss. There are surgeons who would do the same surgery and would have, you know, 500 milliliters of blood loss. So more than 10 times as much as I had, more like 20 times as much. Because they start getting into the bleeding, they don't control the patient's blood pressure, they start ripping veins and arteries, and those things bleed a lot. Um, that being said, today's surgery I thought went pretty well with the exception of my team it made some mistakes uh, with respect to just having the right equipment and, and things ready to go quickly. Uh, I'm a very efficient surgeon. I don't like waiting for the tools that I need. So when I say don't go well, I'm talking nothing bad for the patient, but I, my expectation is that my team is going to perform like a, a Ferrari engine. You know, it's perfect, it's fast, it's reliable, and uh, makes no mistakes. And it gives you the results, the power output you want, when you want it, how you want it. And I just can't stand inefficiencies that are a result of people not doing their job properly. So I tend to complain a lot about those things. Now, you may have heard a lot of complaining today, and that's fine. That's, you know, that's me normally. I'm always complaining about something. Um, rarely is a surgery go perfect without somebody doing something they shouldn't do. Uh, but those things that we do that we shouldn't do are not going to negatively affect the patient outcome. They're just irritating to me. So it's kind of like your kid, 
you know, who goes in the kitchen and, and eats a, a chocolate chip cookie before dinner. It's not really going to make a big impact on their life or your life in any way, but it really pisses you off that they're not following the rules and doing what they're supposed to do. So that's really what I'm talking about. I am a perfectionist. I expect everything to go perfectly well. I, I hire people so that it goes well. I make sure they're trained so that it goes well. And I provide them with the best equipment, the best tools, the best of everything, expecting them to do their job perfectly. You know, sometimes if you watch a Formula One race, you'll see that the team, the pit team, makes a mistake and they don't get the tire off or they don't get the, the, um, the nut that holds the tire on. They won't get that done perfectly. Sometimes uh, they don't even get it at all and the tire comes off. So that's like a highly trained team that makes mistakes and that irritates people to no end. Uh, I always wonder if those people lose their job or if they keep them and just like you know do additional training. I don't know. But I have the same problem. We're like one of those Formula One pit teams that you want a, a um, you know, basically a three second, two and a half second pit stop and you end up with a five second pit stop. And so, you know, the difference between two and a half seconds and five seconds, come on in, is just you know, obviously two and a half seconds, but it's irritating because your expectation for your team is that they're going to perform at the two and a half second, you know, basically the Ferrari or Red Bull or Mercedes level. So when they perform worse and it, it's going to have an effect, but the effect is not huge, um, but only in rare instances is it huge. So uh, anyway, good case, went well. Patient will be going home probably in about an hour and a half. They were under general anesthesia with a tube down their throat. I was able to do everything I wanted to do with respect to decompression and stabilization. Um, it was just a reach to get down there. Uh, it's a C7T1, which is the bottom disc, but I think it went really well. We found herniations at each level. The herniations were causing massive inflammation, and you could see all the scar tissue on top of the dura. And you could see the herniations pushing on the nerves in the neural foramen, particularly at C7T1 on the right side. That's the one I was most worried about. So I think the patient, from a symptomatic standpoint of neck pain and arm symptoms, is going to be very happy. He's going to do fantastic. I think from the standpoint of the instrumentation, he's going to do well. I do believe he's going to have some swallowing difficulties. I do believe that he's going to have some pain with swallowing. He'll have minor discomfort in his neck. I don't think he's going to need anything more than some mild narcotics, maybe for a week after the surgery, maybe two. He will be in a, in a rigid collar for six weeks while he heals up. Patients, I tell them don't smoke and don't use tobacco products. Don't use non-steroidal anti-inflammatories after effusion. So I expect our patient to do very well. But again, he will have a sore throat, a little bit of trouble swallowing things for probably a few days. Um, that being said, um, I'll take any questions you might have. Any questions there, Sean? All right. Great. Well, have a great day. And we have one more surgery next, which is a Duke laser disc repair, lumbar, L34, L45.